Thank you, Kyle. Appreciate you having me. Um, so uh, we'll get right into it today. The name of uh, the presentation today is Dynamic Elbow Bending. So, of course, um, we would love you to do that with bamboo braces, but the key to bracing the elbow, in my opinion, is to keep it dynamic, keep it flexible and resilient. Um, the only reason that there is a bamboo brace is because all of the other things over the years drove me crazy. And so when we developed it, I, I wanted to put as much um, sort of utilitarian and pragmatic use into this brace. It was designed primarily for rehab. Um, I'm a physical therapist by training and uh, I originally designed it primarily for kids with hemiplegia to try to get them to crawl in the quad position. Uh, people use it for a thousand different things um, at this point, but, but the initial intention was for cerebral palsy and, and spasticity. So um, anyway, uh, it's primarily designed for children and adults with neuromuscular diagnoses, but it's getting used for a lot of other different um, situations and diagnoses, and we'll go into a little bit of that uh, at this point. So what is dynamic elbow bracing? Um, I, I hadn't heard this term really used very much before we started uh, developing the bamboo brace, but essentially it's, it's a pretty simple um, uh, definition that you're placing a flexible enough yet stiff enough orthotic at the elbow to help improve alignment. And for more favorable angles to learn gross and fine motor skill, I think that's really the key. Uh, when I, in the early days, when I first started developing this brace, I, I used to put aluminum inside of it. I would bend the aluminum to just um, certain angles. And I, I felt like, uh, you know, that it, it was too rigid for the situation. And I couldn't, kids would look situationally, I should say that uh, from a treatment standpoint, I mostly am an early intervention physical therapist. So I'm generally seeing kids birth to three, birth to five sometimes. I have a private practice in addition to that, uh, which is called professional therapies. And so I do see kids across the range, but most of them, are, and I'm trying to get them to progress uh, through the developmental progression from the lower level uh, to the mid-level to the upper level. And um, we'll go over those definitions in a minute as, as I see them. Um, but but I, I, needed, I needed a brace that would allow us to transition between developmental postures, not just to look good in one posture once the child is put there, uh, I, I have it in here on the slides someplace, but really I only consider an orthotic to be a good orthotic if we can transition with it on. So that goes elbow braces, obviously what we're talking about today, but it could go for AFOs, it can go for TLSOs, it can go for you know cranial shaping helmets and any kind of strapping. Uh, and so we have to be able to transition through the developmental sequence if we're gonna teach children to use, uh, to be independent in a better alignment that we're providing. Um, so again, it's, it's also same definition on this slide, but also used for children with uh, behavioral type issues where they're bringing their hands to their mouth, their hands to their face, hands to hair. I would be lying to you if I told you that I had any of this in mind when we developed it. I had no idea that people would use it for this, um, but they do. And this little girl is just off one of our Instagram followers. She has Rett syndrome. Here's her up in the corner here without braced, you know, out being braced. And then here's down here, I, 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 she's super cute. So we have her in there. But one of the th issues in this brace is it's not applied very correctly. And so what often happens is people, we say extension, so people want to have zero degrees of extension. So they take the brace and then they put the number five piece of plastic in there and and so we're making the brace too stiff and too extension. It's when we say improve alignment, I mean that we need, we would have more extension than we normally would have, but it doesn't mean zero degrees of extension. And I'd also be lying to you if I told you I realized that when we first made it, I didn't. I was going for zero degrees of extension like everybody else seems to do. Whenever we do meetings like this and they're live, invariably someone picks up the brace. By the way, I should tell you, I'll be going back and forth um, I'll, I'll change my screen a little bit, the angle of it, so you can see some of the things we're doing. I have my NDT guy, Chet, here, and we'll do some exercise with him. Um, but, but essentially, 
uh, we want we want the brace to be dynamic and we want it to be flexible. And so in this situation, if we apply the brace a little bit more correctly and a little bit more snug, then we can use a more flexible piece of plastic. When we have the brace applied improperly or too loose, then we we generally the solution is to put more plastic in it, which is exactly what I don't want to do if we can help it. So um, each brace comes with five interchangeable supports. Got a whole collection of them over here for all of our sizes. But essentially, if we can see, I have the um, number two inside of the, my brace, but they come with five stays. I try to get the angle right, but the number one support is most flexible and the number five support is most stiff. And so each brace comes with all five. I would never do that to you where I'd make you pick which support stay to use. And, and then you select the one for your child that you want that encourages the alignment that you would like. So normally in the directions we say, we start with the number three, and then we, ideally we would like to move down in stays. A lot of people move up in stays, but we would like to move down. And so I'm gonna do my best job here in a second of trying to put a bamboo brace on myself, which is it's possible to do, believe it or not. Um, so we, we generally take the, the desired support, we slide it in this uh, piece that we call the channel here. A little hard to see black on black, but we slide the stay in, actually number three in here, sorry. And then we take the little lip on top and we pull it over it. And each piece of plastic is generally about um, a half of an inch shorter than the fabric. Okay, um, so these are some of the features that we have, but before we get to that, I'm gonna show you how I put it on. So this is an extra large brace, number three support in there. I also would never do to you where I make you pick right and left. So if we want, we usually say Velcro tabs, the hook tabs, or what we call the half moon shaped ones. And we generally want those pointing out from the body. So I'm gonna put this on my left arm. We take the, the inner part has a channel that has silicone on it. And in the newer braces that you'll be seeing, the, it's, it has the logo in there. It says bamboo brace, but it's in silicone. The idea of this silicone is to help it to stop from sliding up and down the arm. Um, and those are, you can see on the current slide, those are some of the features. So nothing too scientific. We take it, we place the, the, the channel part aligned up with the radius, if we can, like that with the forearm kind of in a neutral position, equally above and below. One of the features that you see on that slide is that it has two tabs. And so generally I'm gonna do the top tab first and I'm going to, the cool part about having two tabs is you can kind of hold the brace in place for a second. Like that's just holding it enough in place where then I can feed the rest of the bottom tab in and I pull it nice and snug and I put it down and rarely ever do I ever put a brace on where I say, oh, that looks great the first time. I'm always going back and forth between the tabs a couple of times. And when I take the tabs off, they're the Velcro, the good news is the Velcro is really sticky and the bad news is the Velcro is really sticky. So when you take it off, you kind of get your fingers under there and you peel it like, kind of like you peel an orange that way. And then I'm gonna put the upper part in a little bit better. And then this really key to getting it to fit snug is that just before you adhere it, you give it a nice stretch, a half, whatever a half an inch is in centimeters. I don't know, one centimeter maybe. Like that, you give it a nudge, and now I have that brace on. So I can open it for function, we call it, and then I can let it, when I'm not thinking about it, it's going to tend toward extension. I'll say that a bunch of times, but that's really something that we have to remember, that it's going to tend toward extension. And um, so it doesn't mean we have to be at extension all the time. You know, 10 or 15 degrees of flexion is a really useful functional spot. 30 degrees also is, but you know, 110 degrees of flexion isn't so functional all the time. So we want to realign for function. Okay. So um, the adjustable resistance, that's really the hallmark of the brace. Having the five stays that is adjust the flexibility, that's really one of the best things about it. But it's also a really good option to bulky, uh, you know, quilted kind of pillowy type braces that are heavy. And um, it comes in five sizes, you know, seeing, uh, being, you may a couple of months old, uh, all the way through teens and adults. We'll talk a little bit more about the sizing in a minute. Um, I, I mentioned and, and touched on the twin tabs that I like. But it, the only one that doesn't have two tabs is the infant toddler one, the uh, extra small. And that has one tab. Maybe you can see on its arm. 
just one tab in here. So um, that's that's the only one. And one of these days when I have some time to um, work on it, I'll probably figure out a way to put two tabs on that one. Um, won't slide up and down. So we say, I don't want it sliding up and down the arm proximal to distal, but I also don't want it sliding circumferentially. It's a minimalist brace. How minimal of brace can I make to do the job? Um, so I get emails every month and phone calls about people saying, can you put, you know, especially people maybe for behavior, can you put two or three of those plastic channels in there? Could we, um, you know, can we try that? And, and usually my response is that if we're looking for zero degrees of extension without function and without dynamic properties, there's a hundred braces out there that do that. And they're a lot cheaper than us. Um, so if, if that's what you're looking for, this may not be the brace for you. But what we want is if we can keep the channel lined up, you know, um, along the radius for the most part, we can do a lot of really good functional things with only one stay in there. So that's by design. I want as minimal a brace as possible without it getting in the way. Um, and then I would also be lying to you if I told you that I realized what a, sort of a deep uh, sensory experience that kids were going to get from this. I just, I didn't see that coming either. I just wanted a brace that fit really well and didn't move. And um, in the process of doing that, we came uh, with, a, with a brace that really, uh, it wakes up their arm in a sensory way. The kids, uh, they realize it, they start paying attention to it. Some of the neglect features um, go away. The kids will oftentimes bring it, you know, to the parents, especially the kids with motion, ask them to put it on. Uh, it's, it's really popular like that. So, and then here's something I don't even think Kyle knows. We're getting ready to launch um, a supinator strap uh, with with the brace and that supinator strap may look familiar to you guys. It's we make it out of Theratog gold uh, with permission. So if the idea is I want to keep the brace as flexible as possible, but if the kids are pronating and ulnar deviating, then sometimes what it does is it takes the channel and it kicks it a little offline and makes it diagonal. And so they start to get around it in either with spasticity or behavior. So if I can keep the forearm more neutral, then oftentimes we can, um, we can more little piece of plastic. And that's what I'm, that's my objective, right? Because if, if they're, if they're getting offline with it and then they're starting to owner deviate and they get this support stay, the, really the only solution for therapists to this point was to put more plastic in there, which is what I, I don't want to do if I can help it. If I cannot use the number four or the number five supports um, in kids that were using it for rehab, sometimes in the behavior, behavioral kids, they're doing that. But if we can avoid that, I would really like to. Um, so here's just a quick video of a little gal. Um, and we're putting a supinator strap on her in, in combination with the bamboo brace. So normally it's the same idea. I don't need zero degrees of extension in the elbow brace, but I also don't need palm up full supination. And most of the kids are spastic. I'm just looking for new. I'm using a supinator strap in combination with elbow bracing in a gross motor treatment at a park or a playground. I just want enough that it gets it into neutral that I can grab onto the rung of a ladder or climb up on a on a little angled rock wall or something. But look at her offhand in the video. See just that little bit of pronation um, in the offhand and a little bit of deviation. In more mild kids, strapping for supination, especially um, you know in combination with a bamboo brace, is really an effective tool to use. So we'll be those. I'll be offering those to Kyle, I'd say within the coming six to eight weeks. We've been dabbling with them for a while, trying to figure out the strap we like. I, I, I think we will continue to, to offer strapping um, in terms of realignment of the forearm. Whether or not we'll continue to use Theratog Gold or not, I don't know. It has really good qualities, but sometimes it's a little too stretchy, and sometimes we need a little bit more of a um, you know, a strap that is not quite as dynamic. So that's what we've been dabbling with. And we'll be offering those, we'll be providing those to Remington and they can provide those in Canada um, for, you know, for your needs. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and take this bamboo brace off. So again, I'm gonna get in there, like I'm my four fingers under using my like the, uh, uh, thenar eminence and hypothenar eminence coming off like that. And we'll take it off. Okay, 
Did I skip? Oh, let me see. Okay. So um, these are some of what we would consider to be the benefits of the brace. Promotes independent motor control of the trunk and shoulder without elbow interference. If I'm able to impart anything to you today, that's what I want to impart to you. It's an elbow brace, but it has nothing to do with the elbow. It's realigning the elbow to allow us to gain proximal control. I believe some people, there's always a debate in our world, right? Are you born with the control you have or can you foster control um, at joints where, where uh, we have neuromuscular involvement? And, and I, I happen to believe that I think we can foster control. I've, I've seen it in treatment. I believe we can do it, but we can't do it with the, um, we can't do it with the arm and, or sorry, with the shoulder and the elbow coupled together in a spastic synergy. So, you know, if I ask Chet to flex his elbow, he does, but he, I'm sorry, flex his shoulder rather. He flexes it, but he flexes it with his elbow at the same time in that spastic synergy. So if I take the elbow out of pattern and now I ask, ask Chet, flex your shoulder, that's control that he wouldn't have known without the coupling to that abnormal or that non-functional synergy, whatever you want to call it, that's, you know, uh, shoulder inward rotation, um, you know, elevation, elbow flexion, ulnar deviation, pronation, fisting of the hand and fingers. Um, so that's really what we're trying to do, realign the elbow so that we can impart um, better motor control and strength and function proximally. Then we work our way down the extremity. Um, as Kyle mentioned in the bio, um, a lot of what I would uh, a lot of training is, is NDT based in children and base. So a lot of my foundation is that, but no matter what sort of um, kind of therapeutic theories and, and treatment you subscribe to, uh, you know, that ability for the brain to be plastic and malleable and overcome is an important one to understand. And, and I really feel that to be the case in, in kids with neuromuscular involvement. Um, so some of the other things, it, it assists in weight bearing and crawling and transitions, and those are great things, but, and that's what I used to do, um, work closed kinetic chain constantly. I'd put the brace on and we'd go right into the quad or four point position. We'd do weight bearing on it. So in reverse camera angle here. So, and, and you can't really go wrong with closed chain, but what I failed to do early in, in the early years of this brace was work equally in the open chain in the open kinetic chain and in, in positions like supine, really taking the elbow alignment and, and being able to focus on the, sh the shoulder in the open chain um, in, in treatment sitting or standing at, at objects, working in the open chain, combine my open chain treatment with my closed chain weight bearing. So yes, you can never go wrong with, with weight bearing activities. They're super helpful and goodness knows our kids don't get enough of it. But paying attention to the combination of the open chain with the closed chain is really made my treatment effective over the years and it's made the bamboo brace ultimately way more successful. Um, so we can use it on assistive devices like Lucas here is doing. You'll see a little bit of Lucas throughout this video. Um, he, you know, he's carrying oxygen around with him and a feeding uh, pump and all kinds of stuff. And he responded really well to the, to the braces bilaterally for low tone as a genetic condition. So we'll talk more about that, but then, so, in addition to promoting independent motor control at the, of the trunk and the shoulder and proximal structures, the other thing that I have bolded down here is, is facilitate more spontaneous function by incorporating in the principles of writing and equilibrium into your treatment and into the way and, and isolating those on the structures that we want to get stronger. So in this case today, we're going to talk about some floors for could be younger kids, but it also could be older kids down in working through transitional things. Um, but what we wanna do is we wanna hitch our wagon to those automatic responses that are in there. Lois Bly, if I'm sure everyone hopefully has heard of Lois Bly, I, I you know, just value a lot to what she brings to therapy. It's amazing. But she would tell you that those automatic reactions are in there. It's our job to go find them. They might be fragmented and splintered and not very effective, but if we go find them and build on them, and if we build on them and we build on them in a functional way, we're, we're sort of, we're, we're getting a, a double benefit. We're getting the strengthening that we would like to get in the proximal structures of the shoulder and the trunk, but we're also getting the strength that we want there as well as if we were just sitting in a treatment asking a kid to grab this or grab that. But by moving through and facilitating through developmental postures and incorporating writing in equilibrium, um, it's, it's one of the best ways to help kids progress 
from a physical therapy standpoint, for sure. And that's what I know most about, of course. Um, keeping the brace flexible and dynamic, that overrides everything. So I don't like to brace kids from the axilla to the wrist if I can help it, because that defeats one of my purposes, which was keep the brace um, you know, inobtrusive and out of the way. If we look at Chet, he's wearing the extra small brace. We've got some skin, you know, a couple of centimeters up here, I'm trying to use my centimeters today, up here and a couple of centimeters down here, maybe a centimeter down below. So this, this infant brace fits him really well. But if, if Chet is super spastic and I've got to keep the number four support or, or the number five support in here to keep Chet's alignment like I would want, then I can say, if I go to a longer lever arm, like with the small brace, so this is the small brace we sometimes call preschool. But if I put that on there, I've probably just barely got enough room for that small brace to watch at. But it's it's going to be a little bit long, and I'm going to be, oh, geez, I really didn't want it to be from his axilla to his wrist. However, if I put that small brace on chat, maybe I can use the number two support or the number three support without using the number four support and the number five support because we have a longer lever arm. And that really is the key, is keeping the brace as flexible as you can keep it. Um, when we're breaking plastic supports, most of the time we're breaking the number two and the number one, sometimes the number three. We're not often breaking the four and the five. But if you guys are starting with the number three and we're trying to make the brace more flexible and you're moving down to the number two to try to see how it responds, or the number one to see how it responds. And we end up breaking stays. Uh, either Kyle will replace those or we will replace them. And we'll send them to you from the States. We won't charge for that. Um, Remington has a very good customer service and return policy, by the way, but, but we'll even go beyond that. So if you're having problems with the brace, if it's not the right size, if there's having a problem with plastic, if there was a rip or a tear, as a manufacturer, we'll, we'll warranty those. I expect a brace to last between eight and 12 months with pretty regular use. Um, so if we're two or three months into a brace and, it, and it's failing in some way, then you just have to send us an email and we'll warranty those for you. Either either I'll have uh, Remington replace that for you and then we'll reimburse Remington with, those, with that product if that's faster to get it to you, or we'll send it from the States. Um, so, oh, I, I wanna go back real quickly. So, in addition to the supinator strap, one of the other exciting features that we're going to have is the ability on that last one to cut braces down. So sometimes we have a child like in Chet's situation who, who might benefit from a longer brace, but found it. so we have enough length, but we call the length of the brace is the length of the channel. So we might have a child who has enough length to, to accommodate the small brace but maybe the wraparound of the brace is too much. Um, and because with each size as we go up, um, the small and extra small wrap around about eight. Um, there's my sizing guide. They wrap around, um, uh, well, I can't get rid of that, so sorry, Kyle. Anyway, um, they wrap around about eight inches. And then as we go up to the medium, it wraps around 10 inches and the large wraps around 12 inches and the extra large wraps around 15 inches. So as we go up, we might have enough length in the arm to accommodate a longer brace, but the wrap round is increasing the bulk, which is one of those things I told you that I don't like. I want you to be able to wear it on the skin. I want it to be worn under clothes. I don't want it to be um, have all kinds of excess material. So we'll be coming out in the newer braces probably within the next, I'm gonna say six to eight weeks, we will go away where we will have cut down points on these braces. And there's nothing, there's no amount of braces that you could ruin by cutting them down. Um, I'm gonna use this supinator strap for definition on the video, but we would have like a, a cut down point on the brace, maybe an inch and a half in or two inches in, we're still working through what we want so that you can come and with a pair of scissors and just cut your bamboo brace off. It'll be in the medium and the large and the extra large sizes. You'll be able to cut your brace down so you get to take advantage of less wrap around and but you get the advantage of having the longer brace and and that there's no amount of those that you could ruin that would stop me from sending you more to ruin so and families and moms to cut them down um i i we just we want to give people the ability to do that and be a physical therapist for a long time as kyle mentioned I just, I don't have a lot of patience for products that we can't modify. 
And I don't have patience for companies that if you did modify their product that they can stand behind it as still being warrantied. Uh, so, so we are super excited for that. I think it's gonna be revolutionary in the bracing world that you can cut those down, get them to size like you want, not have to worry about not being able to return it if it doesn't work or get your money back if it doesn't work or if you don't like it. Um, so we'll, we'll stand behind all that through Remington and in addition to Remington. So uh, now getting on to, to some treatment stuff, um, the uh, elbow brace, sorry, the, um, I got myself backwards here for a second. It's an elbow brace, but again, it's about the sagittal realignment. Um, they would say in, in that we uh, realign in the sagittal plane, but we function in the frontal and transverse or life happens in the frontal and transverse again, as Lois Bly likes to say. So, and the elbow is a flexion extension joint. So we're gonna, and also when we talk about realignment in the sagittal plane, we can also talk about realignment of um, the trunk and the core. So it's, it's not only getting, you know, realignment in the elbow that we're talking about, but we're also getting realignment in the trunk. So as we do that, um, we can then move out into the frontal plane or then move into the transverse plane and we're lined up for function. If we're trying to move out into the frontal and transverse planes um, in poor alignment, the repetitions that we get are not as quality and the things and the skills that we're teaching the kids are not as effective or as functional. So um, this is a little guy, his name is Samir. He's very spastic quad. And so this is an idea where uh, you know, the, the tumble forms floor sitter was probably not win any postural awards, but we um, we have the wedge back here. So I have it more in extension than I want. His dad, also named Michael, is running the blocks. So right here, that's not a super good rep at the shoulder, I don't think. But as I get his dad to capture the blocks, capture him visually, he's talking to him. We get the blocks, we catch him there. That's the repetition I want at the shoulder. That's the one. So then we're gonna reorganize him. We're gonna get his trunk aligned a little bit better. So there's a really good um, example of open chain function and strength and trying to develop the motor control at the shoulder without the elbow interference. But look at the flexion of the elbow. That's a small brace. I usually try to call out what we're wearing. It's a small brace with a number two support in a pretty spastic 23, 24 month old kid right there. Um, you know, like I said before, you can never go wrong working on closed chain. There's a lot of good benefits of it. Um, me trying to manage her elbows up here in the top, this is Lily, um, also pretty spastic. But me trying to manage her elbows up in here and trying to get any kind of quality weight bearing uh, without having to continually be on her elbows. In the NDT world, we would say key points. That's where my hands are making contact with the patient. So. I'm trying to, to keep proximal kind of pelvic key points here, but I'm not having very much success because her elbows are in, in super poor alignment for the job that I would like to do. Down here, these are pretty old school, early bamboo braces, by the way. Um, and, and we used to have a channel on the outside. So look how nice her neck has opened up, the shoulders have come down, um, wrists wrist and, and fingers in, or you know, wrist anyway in extension. So we're getting some quality weight bearing. Um, when I look at this picture, and I say, wow, look how good she looks. It always reminds me to say that about the time that I'm saying, wow, how good does she look? I probably should have moved um, developmentally in that point. So, and then the other thing, this is now getting into the bit about try to using um, the writing and equilibrium reactions that we all have built intrinsically within us, trying to use those to get the function that you need. Um, uh, many of you may have heard before. So, so why is it that, um, well, when, we're, when we weight shift, this is key in here, he's a right hemi. He's got the little infant base with a number, under number two support in there. Um, but as he's, if he, as he's bearing weight on his left side here and he's looking visually over at, at an octopus um, and he's, it's closer than it looks to him by the way. And he's formulating in his mind how to reach and grab that. On the weight-bearing side, he is long through that musculature. Look, he's long through the shoulder. He's long. He's short on this side of the trunk, but he's long on the left side of the trunk. He's long in the left leg. Conversely, on the uphill side or the non-weight-bearing side, he's short. He's short through the hip flexor. He's short through the trunk here. He's short through the shoulder, 
short through the head and neck, and he's writing himself against gravity in this position. Consequently, he's supposed to be flexed there. If, he's, if I have a number five support in that brace right there and he's not flexed, then I'm going against the developmental relationships where we're long on the weight-bearing side and short on the non-weight-bearing side. So why is it that we're on the short and long in those relationships between weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing? And, and I think that many people believe that that is a kind of a, it's just a survival response. We're all sitting here looking at this webinar and most of us would be sitting like I am with my head upright against gravity. If I'm knocked off balance, I'm gonna try and write myself backward against gravity. And I'm gonna start with head writing and then trunk writing and then move my equilibrium sequence of the seven components of abduction on the uphill side, adduction on the downhill side, dorsiflexion of the feet and wrists, um, and then some rotation mixed in there. So to get myself back on balance, I'm gonna go through that sequence of movements to try and do that. Well, it just so happens if we're doing that and we're treating in a with dynamic elbow bracing or in any other way, even without it, we're gonna key ourselves into that and allow us to get the strength. So in Kean's in Kean's situation, because he's I've got a flexible support in there, he's flexed here. Now I'm getting some strength at the shoulder, taking the idea away from the elbow right here. Look at proximally, I'm starting to get some. He's riding himself back up against gravity. He's the long and short relationships are intact. We're getting some abduction strength there and keying into writing at the same time, which is gonna help him function. And I sh should take this time to say, just for, for my talk today, when I'm gonna say low level in relation to gravity, low level in terms of function, but low level in terms of gravity is supine, sideline, and prone. We would say low level. And then I'm going to say mid-level postures are those that are in quadruped, in sitting, and kneeling, and then upper level is standing and walking and anything that comes with that. So I want an orthodox, especially at the elbow, because that's what we're talking about today, that is able to be um, flexible enough for we can transition upwards gravity. Um, so going, moving on to bilaterally for, ho for a high tone rather, um, this is uh, Samir again, and this is a little scooter board that his dad ingeniously made, but it's his legs are in pattern, and, and that always upsets me when I have things that are in pattern that I don't have them out of pattern, but really what I'm concentrating on here in here is his shoulder girdle. So when I'm giving them a home program to use it bilaterally for ho -tone, uh, excuse me, high tone, then I'm trying to get them to get some shoulder flexion and shoulder abduction and shoulder movement. So we have him up a little bit off the floor, but look how much flexion is in the elbow still. Number uh, two, two support in the small brace. But look how in a second here, his hands will open up and he comes down. That's a very nice flexion. So when he's not flexing, he's not pulling through with the left arm there, then it tends back toward extension in a gentle, encouraging way. So not zero degrees of extension, just more extension than we might've had. And then this is, um, it's not a very glorious video down here, but this is Samir. What I'm really looking for here, we're rolling to his left, but what I'm really looking for is to continue the transition to rolling and I'm looking at the action of the left shoulder as he comes through the roll. So he comes over here to grab this. Look, we're long and short where we should be. Not so much in the legs, but definitely in the upper extremity in the, in the trunk. And then what I want as I move the toy is him to take that weight shift and continue it on to the right side and now abduct the left hand. It takes us a minute and it's a very ragged repetition, but it's a starting point. And this is, so as he goes to start, it's that little abduction of his right there. And then he headbutts that toy, which is amazing. But he, um, that little bit of abduction back there, that's what we're looking for in that very, very early rudimentary um, repetition, a good combination of closed kinetic chain and open kinetic chain. So this is Samir again, using him bilaterally for high tone. Now I have him, we're climbing steps. So now I get to take his, his lower extremities out of pattern and I can keep my key points more based around the pelvis uh, and, and the trunk and the lower extremity. And now that I have embraced, he can, we can transition upward here and there's just that little kind of split second when 
he's we're transitioning here and the legs are out of pattern and the upper extremities are out of pattern and then it allows the core to do what it was supposed to do which was to be a communicator or a conduit between the pelvic girdle and the shoulder girdle if we have the pelvic girdle blocked by patterns and we have the shoulder girdle blocked by patterns then the trunk becomes very floppy and that's why the kids are spastic in the extremities but but low tone in the trunk because the trunk never gets any work because it's continually blocked from both ends so in this case the elbow is an easy joint to brace. It's one of the easiest. So we take the upper extremity out of pattern to some degree. We mellow out the synergy in the upper extremity to some degree. And then it allows us within that improved sagittal alignment to start to move uh, out into the frontal plane. Uh, discussing again what, what I touched upon before. Look, it's very subtle, but he's short here because my weight is over here. We're moving diagonally toward the left as we shift weight onto that, down through that knee and into the foot, into this part of the base of support. We're gonna take the weight and move it gently that direction. And as we do, he's gonna become shorter over here and he's gonna become longer over here. And so I am always paying attention to those developmental relationships when they should be short on the non-weight bearing side and long on the weight bearing side. And if I'm not getting that in my transitions between developmental postures, I have to figure out why I'm not getting that and I have to change it. And that's just one of the reasons that we developed an elbow brace because I looked at it and said, I can't possibly get those long and short relationships to work if I'm constantly having to, to have my key points on the elbow. Um, also, I put this in here because I love it when people use it for, for water therapy. There's no amount of chemicals or chlorine that could eat away the stitching or the Velcro or the plastic or whatever that would stop me from sending you more braces to use in water um, or in different activities. And so here's, a, here's just a nice open chain activity where she's getting some ab and adduction that she normally wouldn't get realigned at the elbow. I love that little neck floaty. That's one of my favorite pool implements. Um, so then using it unilaterally for high tone, um, real quick here with chat, we want to, as we're, that combination, like we saw in the earlier slides with Kian, um, and, I've, and at the time I didn't point out for Megan, but she was out of pattern, that's her in the top video. But as, as we get, um, I've been told by the, the uh, brilliant OTs of the world, and there are many, that if I get eye and hand and, Ah, I lost my toy. We're going to use this AirPod case. But um, if I get eye and hand and toy and brain all in the same solar system, then um, what I can do is I can, I can allow him to start to regard that arm. When I first brace the, the elbow, the shoulder is going to be extremely weak and it's going to fall out to the side. And, and I get a lot of emails every month saying, I love your brace. It fits great. But Every time I put it on, he just drops his arm out to the side. So we're gonna come in here in the open chain and support that, maybe up against the couch, like you're gonna see in Megan's video up top. But as we do that, and he starts to regard that, then we start to get some rolls where he's rolling over across his body with the hemi arm. So here we're supposed to be short, and he is, and we're supposed to be short in the head and the neck, and he is. But it's that interplay, when I'm talking about floor skills, and sometimes we would lecture just a whole day or two days just on floor skills. But as he's coming across like that, and he's short where he should be short, then if he gets a toy here and he reaches it, I'm going to allow him to come back to his back and play with it. The old me would have wrestled it away from him and made him stay there another 20 or 30 seconds. So I work on tummy time, but only in 15 or 20 seconds at a time. Then I might wrestle it away from him. I might put it again, and as he goes to roll to get it, just before he reaches it, maybe I move the toy over here. And what I'm what I'm trying to do is get the that developmental relationship of long and short here. Then he's going to complete the roll, and now we're going to switch from being short on the uphill side to long on the uphill side. And now he's short on the new uphill side. And so as he grabs that toy, then I would roll him to his back. So I'm going to use those developmental relationships to go back and forth all the time. And, and it's that interplay that allows me to teach things like prone pivot and teach things like army crawl. So instead of going um, right to four point, if I work in the, in the, um, if I work in the open chain, by the time I get to four point, these kids, they just crawl. I don't even need to work on it. It just happens because I've spent so much time facilitating and initiating symmetry on the floor 
that I don't have to go back and 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 just work in four points specifically. Um, here's a quick video of Megan. She this is just a consult. Um, she's rolling just across her body. She looks better there, okay. But look how we're still short on the weight bearing side. So we we have some work to do there early in the treatment on the scapula and on the lat to try to get some length here so that as she comes, yes, yeah, she's she's sort of leaning on the braced arm and she's playing over here, but she's not as long as she as she would be. I would normally come in here, you know, and, and meet Megan. That was just a consult where we were bracing, but I normally would come in there and really get some mobility in the lats and the scapula and around the scapula thoracic area so that we can, in the rib cage, so that we can get long where we need to be long. Um, this is the old me with weight bearing. This is a little guy with, uh, from Texas got sent a video. I have a hard time if we're just over a bolster bearing a minimal amount of weight here. I have a hard time generalizing how, how do I get from here, <coughs> excuse me, to actually functioning. Like how do I get from there to actually moving around? So I don't do a lot of just very static kind of weight bearing like that. I'm mostly trying to stay dynamic. Here's a little uh, left hemi, um, Sophie is her name. She's got the baby brace with the number one in the and two. So this is why we keep it flexible. Look, she's not really a quad crawler yet. She's an army crawler. So I wanna give her the ability to come upward against gravity always takes longer when you're watching your own videos. There she comes up and then she's back down. But if I've got a number three in there even, may, uh, number four in there, there's no way that we're coming up and down through that transition from the low level into the mid level. And here she is in the mid level. Sometimes we just stay in one level. So uh, many of you would know that from rolling around on the floor like we were just doing with Chet. We stayed in the low level the whole time, supine to side lying, um, you know, to prone. But we can also stay in the mid level, or we can still stay in this in the same level, in this way. Sorry, by just staying in the mid level the whole time instead of like I was explaining in the low level. So we're gonna. T I'm I'm just explaining to her mom about, um, you know, alignment. Do I have my volume on? So, but in in this position, look at keying into the automatic reactions. As she comes through this weight shift, look at the flexion of the shoulder, a little bit of abduction of the shoulder. Okay, that's the one I want. Look at this one right here. I used to chase three-year-olds around at the park and kind of trip them down and push them down and see if I could get them to protect themselves. This is where it starts, This even before this, but it's the automatic reactions. Look at the long short relationships still that are happening. We're aligned in the sagittal plane. We're moving into frontal and transverse. So one of her abductions, if that's a, the way you would term it, one of her, you know, where she abducts and places that arm has got to be worth 25,000 of mine. So me keeping my key points off of the arm, trying to get, you know, that, just those little, um, and if I take it and place it, because I think it's going to be better, that's not as effective as her doing it herself. And it's just those, we're keying into those automatic reaction, or reactions of riding in equilibrium to get the strengthening that we want. And in this case, we stayed in the mid-level the whole time. So this is a little guy, he's a hemi. There's a training video on bamboobrace.com. His name's Roddy, he's a super funny guy. But this is him running around at the park. He's from Puerto Rico, got displaced by the hurricane a few years back. He, his mom, he didn't really have any therapy when he was younger, like a baby, but he crawled in four point. So a lot of people will take the brace off once the kids get up to standing, but look at that patterning. Look how it's shutting down his entire side. The entire side of the rib cage is being shut down by that. He's pretty functional when you talk to him and, um, and you want him to, to do stuff with his left hand, he can, but in an automatic way, he doesn't. And so this is just a snippet of this video here, but I'm gonna do, you know, get in there and do some lengthening at times. It's just a short amount of that. But as we go, if I speed up my walking, I get extension in the trunk. If I slow down, I get flexion. But once I get him lined up where I want, boom, we're into the transverse and the frontal. So now I look at the abduction and the adduction where he's hanging on, that's the strengthening I'm talking about. If we don't have him realigned at the elbow right there, I don't think we get that quality strengthening at the shoulder, okay? Um, 
this is one of my favorite pictures. This is, so this is Roddy and we're climbing a, a little ladder apparatus at the playground. What I love about this, look, speaking of long and short relationships, we're long over here where we should be long. We're short over here where we should be short. I've got elbow flexion under there underneath my key point, which we should have. I've got Roddy's eye and Roddy's brain and Roddy's hand about ready to grab this rail. So I've got all four of those things. And in a second, when my key point down here distally, as I shift his weight and in combination with my guiding hand there, as I shift his weight over, then we're gonna, then our long and short relationship is going to change. And then I'm gonna be long over here as he hits that rail. But one of the best things I like about being able to keep my key point more proximal here is that Roddy doesn't have to look at my hand, grab his hand and put it on this rail. Roddy gets to see his hand touch that rail and that visual feedback is just priceless in our world. Um, so this is a little girl, uh, Star is her name, about nine or 10 years old, never had an elbow brace on before. So she's poorly aligned in the wrist and the hand and fingers. And I'm certain we would wanna try and do that. But right here, what I'm doing is I'm just working on her shoulder. She thinks that's kind of funny. This is a thing like we're doing today, but live when we do it at clinics. And I'm just trying to get her to use that shoulder and bring it through. Yes, that alignment is not very good in the wrist and hand. And we would probably wear it in combination with some kind of wrist and, and thumb splint, maybe strapping of some kind. But really just to show you, that's like the first time she's ever had a brace on and we can really isolate and work on the shoulder at that time. We would do all kinds of mobility in there, no question, at the rib cage and the shoulder, but just a, just a really quick rough, like raw uh, use of that brace. Um, you can tell she's rarely ever borne any weight through that arm. Um, so we would work open chain for sure with some mobility and then close chain. This is an older guy uh, with, a, with a decently mild stroke, but look at the flexion in the brace. We're gonna go through that same developmental sequence like I was going through with the kids on the floor, but he's an older guy in his 80s, so we're gonna use the mat for that. But as we come through, we're getting some nice weight bearing, but look at the flexion in the brace. Um, moving along to using it laterally for low tone. This is Lucas, he's got P9 deletion um, syndrome pulmonary hypertension, all kinds of things. But as he's moving, I want you to watch the flexion in the braces. So I would submit to you that when we're using it bilaterally for, ho for low tone, um, that as the kids flex into the brace, the brace rebounds. And, we, and I believe that we get an active assistive rep in there if the brace is dynamic enough and if it's not stiff. This is the small brace with the number two support. If I have in there, he might look good crawling around on his knees, but he's not getting over when we're out of the brace. Watch as he's, and it allows me to keep my key points more distal down below the knees. But as we're walking, watch, the, there we go, that left brace flexes and it rebounds. So in kids with low tone, generally just using it during treatment. We're going to use it, um, you know, during therapy. Maybe if the moms want to use it at home, they can. But the children that we're generally ordering it for and getting it for home programs are those kids with, with high tone or kids that are using it for behavior. So, um, but kids with low tone, that's when we might just have some braces in the clinic and we would use the braces for the kids during treatment. The children with higher tone, they need to wear it on some and kind of a schedule. They need to wear it for a few hours in the morning. If we're going to get motor control improvement that we want in the strength, then we have to practice in the new alignment. And we, with kids with high tone, we can't do that if we're just using the brace during treatment. They have to have it where they're wearing it for a few hours, take it off for a bit, put it back on for a few hours. Um, if anyone subscribes to Theratogs and that kind of durable therapy, you're wearing it, we're gonna practice and repeat within the alignment that we want. This is a little guy, Blake, with, um, with Down syndrome, and we have him angled, so the weight bearing requirement is less, but also bilaterally for high tone. This guy was uh, like one of the, a potted plant. We had him on his rear, and then if you tried to touch him or move him, he screamed, and so you're sort of sat there and tried to decide at what point during the treatment would I grab onto him. But something about that sensory experience of the brace around his arms, that's the little infant toddler brace with the number two. Um, but something about that experience around his arms, it really made him settle in and enjoy weight bearing where before he just detested it. And this is maybe the second time in the braces and he comes up. And so we're just building strength within the session in children with low tone. Um, and, and, and transitioning, he's coming sort of down into that heel sitting, but transitioning in and out of developmental postures, super helpful. Um, again, 
If we're using it for behavior, this is that little girl with Rhett. If we're using it for behavior, I want just enough stiffness in the brace, just enough body in the brace that we can um, allow her to function, but not allow her to get to her face or her hair or her eyes or whatever it is that she's, the behavior that she's doing that we would like her not to do. And so, but we want to, we want to dabble on that, like how much flexibility can I give her, but not allow her to that behavior, as opposed to just going right for the number five support right off the bat. And, and then we, again, just enough resistance in the supports to make them do, to give up and move on to something else that's more functional than the self-stem behavior. This is Lucas after he started walking and his mom would use them for behavior as well. Um, and then we're on to questions. All right. Well, thanks, Michael. That's great. You know, I, I, the presentation is fantastic. We get a lot of questions coming into our office about the bamboo brace and this must for much more than what the name says as a brace and especially for uh, the active assist part that you highlighted. So we really wanted to make sure we bring that out for everyone. we got a couple of questions here. Uh, the first question is, uh, you may have answered this, but let's just go through this. How much flexion can you still achieve with the bamboo brace example on a child who has strong tendency to bring hands to mouth? Uh, it's it's just all a, all a question. I think I think I sort of touched on that just barely, but we it, it's a process where you're going to go through the stays to see how much flexibility can I give them. Occasionally, you can trick them. I would say maybe 15% of the time, 20% of the time, where you start out with, say, for example, eight in behavior or maybe a number four in behavior. And we put it on them for a few weeks and then we move down and they kind of get into the mindset, oh, they're going to put these braces on me, then I guess I can't bring my hands to my mouth. And they sort of learn that when they have the braces on that they can't do that behavior. And then we, we sort of slightly replace with a more flexible stay and then they still don't come to their mouth, but they allow themselves more functions. I wish that happened like 95% of the time, but it doesn't. It happens, you know, probably more exceptionally than regularly. However, that's one way, but I think mostly you're just within the session. I still would recommend we start with the number three and see how we do. Uh, the behavior kids also, they won't go into to pronation and ulnar deviation spastically like children with higher tone would, but sometimes they do it strategically. So they figure out, oh, if I, if I pronate my forearm and I fist my hand or ulnar deviate, then I can move around this piece of, uh, uh, disturbing plastic that my parents and therapists decided was a good idea for me. And so they get around it. And, and so sometimes even with the behavior kids, that might be an indication for supinator strapping. If we keep the, keep the forearm a little bit better aligned and they can't get around it quite as quickly, but it's all a process. We're, um, it's, it's a great brace. It's not a brace for everyone. You'd, you'd start and sort through it and see if it's gonna do what you need to do. Sometimes um, you know, people are really injuring themselves and we need more, more brace than, than what this one can offer. So you just kind of work through that. Okay, perfect. Okay, I know we got five minutes left and we'll get you out of here before one o'clock. Uh, really quickly, Michael, can it also control hyperextension? Great question. I just got this one the other day. I, the answer to that is um, stay tuned. What I wanna do for that is what I'd like to do is to take um, my, my current experiment for that is to take something like a supinator strap and come around, you know, come around into, into supinator strapping, but then take the, if, if flexion isn't a problem, but hyperextension is, we would probably take the piece of plastic out and then we would come up and tether, pull the, pull the child into some amount of flexion here and then tether the supinator strap at the upper end of the bamboo brace so it's like a flexion stop an extension stop rather, maybe we stop them at 10 degrees or five degrees or zero, but we don't let them go into that, you know, 15 degree hyperextension really, you know, uh, upsets people. And so I don't know, I'll keep working.